afternoon. Thanks for coming for lunch and lecture. I yeah. so just, yes. just speak closer here because okay. this is the mic. He said I didn't have to. I'm Jillian Grafton. I'm one of the critical care fellows. And we're going to talk about sepsis and pH today. There'll be a little bit of PAH and a little bit of pH and RV failure. No disclosures. So I start off with this slide because I think when we see them in the ICU, this is how these patients' RV failure and um, pulmonary hypertension look. You think, how the heck did this patient even get to the ICU and why are we trying to save them? But really, honestly, these patients could have looked like this just a few days prior. And they get sick, they get septic, and they um, go down really quickly and they look really sick. But this is why we try to save these patients, because just a few days before, they didn't look so bad. So just a quick review. We know that um, in sepsis, there's an increased vascular permeability and vasodilation, a decrease in the SVR, and typically, a good heart should increase the cardiac output to compensate for these changes. Patients with pH, sometimes they just are not able to increase their cardiac output, and, and this is, seems to be a little bit bigger of a problem for them, and typically because of the right ventricular failure, which we'll talk about a lot here. And they rapidly deteriorate, and leading to hemodynamic instability and death. And really, the mortality rates for these people are quite high, 30 to 41 percent. This was actually a PAH number, but they also are quote that if these, if you have to do CPR on these patients, the chance of recovery is zero to six percent in these patients. So we're going to talk about the heart a little bit. Um, so the left ventricle, we know it's the thick. Um, a lot of times it's uh, d described as a bullet shape, but thick muscle, bullet shape, left side. The contraction is most, well, longitudinal, but circumferential is um, one of the contractions that the left ventricle has opposed to the right ventricle. And really the septum is a very important part to the contraction of the left ventricle. We see up in the uh, left corner, it's a nice donut shape. Uh, and when you see this, these, the contraction on a short axis, it, it stays that nice circular shape. The right ventricle is a thin, walled, kind of triangular that hugs the septum and allows the septum to keep, typically in a normal heart, the septum bows a little bit out into the RV and has this nice, nice donut shaped. Then here we'll see more pictures here, but the RVOT, which is important in a normal functioning RV. Here again, you see the right ventricle kind of hugs that septum a lot, but the septum is allowed to go into the right ventricle. We talked about the septum, um, and we'll talk a lot more about it, but one of the biggest problems that we see in RV failure is that septum, the, due to the pressures on the RV, starts bowing into the LV, it, and it makes it very hard for the left ventricle to fill and to maintain a good cardiac output. When when we talk about the, 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 how the septum works and how it is affected by the different pressures in the heart, it's referred to as a phenomenon of ventricular interdependence. So here's a, a nice normal echo, uh, four-chamber apical found on the left side of the chest. And we see the, a nice normal LV here a nice, small, well-functioning RV with slow computer. Some of the things that we're going to look at closely as we see the septum is, is nicely in the center here. The RV, we're going to look at a, a decent amount of about the annulus right here. As you can see that the right ventricle, a lot of the motion is the longitudinal motion of the annulus right here is how it gets its cardiac output. Here's another normal echo, which is a lot the type of pictures that we tend to see more commonly than we'd like. We, they're not, it's not a great picture. We can imagine that the LV is working quite well. We can see the walls coming in quite nicely. 
And the RV, we don't have a great idea of where this RV free wall is. So it's really hard to comment on this, the size of the RV at this point. But I think there's some other important things that we see with this echo. We can see that that annulus is moving quite well to the apex of the heart. And also that the right atrium is small and probably making the thought that there's a lot of a severe tricuspid regurgitation from long-standing RV unlikely. So typically there's a very low vascular resistance in the lungs and really the pulmonary circulation is able to accommodate large increases in volume to maintain a cardiac output. We, the RV does a great job of keeping up with the left ventricle by, by um, some of the changes it does. And part of it is recruiting the, the unused vessels in the lungs, and then also by dilating the right ventricular outflow track. And really, pulmonary blood flow rarely limits cardiac output in normal physiology. So I talked about the dilation of the outflow region, this RVOT. I used this too much already. This region right here. Incre and which gives you increased compliance and allows the RV stroke um, volume to keep up with the left ventricular out. And what's really interesting is by the right <coughs> ventricle really can handle large preload, and we're going to talk more about preload and afterload, um, without a lot of increase of stroke work, which is important. All right, this is where we get to talk about fun cardiology things. So I need four volunteers to come up here. Two. Two. Five to this balloon. Ten for us. Come on, Dad, come on. Don't go crazy. Only two. This is normal breath. Right. Fifteen breaths. Let Jesse blow some hot air. <laughs> All right, you did too? Okay, so, okay. I'll do you did 15. That's fine. Oh, it should be one, two, something. So we're doing, Ash did two breaths. Me? Yep, yeah, you did five breaths. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weak, I laugh. <laughs> That's not five breaths. Oh, five in. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, that's an important thing. Ten breaths. Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. This is his five, and that's your ten. <laughs> give, give him a few more breaths. <laughs> All right, so let some air out of yours. These breaths are like crazy. <laughs> All right, so this is when we talk about preload. This is really so. Ash is a CVP of two, so let your balloon go. Really, that's your cardiac output. Not great. Now we have five. Oh, <laughs> five breaths. So let it go. Let it fly. <laughs> Okay, so in 10 breaths, which should be a bigger balloon, but go ahead. <laughs> so as we go up the CVP, we do get an increase in cardiac output. When we go to 15, we have RV failure, clearly. <laughs> um, but also, once, I mean, it was hard to breathe 15 breaths into that balloon. There was a struggle. <laughs> so it's also showing that you get to a part that the balloon is stretched enough that adding more volume or preload puts the RV into failure or pops your balloon. And it definitely increases the amount of work that the RV has to do or to be able to fill the RV more. So that, we had, wait, there's a couple of you guys have to stay still. <coughs> You'll get another chance here, Jesse. You can roll this one up. Ten breaths. Ten breaths. I'll do this one. Okay, we'll try
it's weak, man. <laughs> All right. So what we're talking about after load here, so after load is the amount of pressure that the balloon has to, um, that the balloon feels as air leaves the balloon, and we'll talk more about it. But you let your balloon go. So that's the after load of minimal. And this is what an RV feels like in a patient with PAH. So it's, it's having, the blood is having to go through much higher resistance to be able to obtain the cardiac output. All right, you guys can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> so as we talked about, preload is essentially the end diastolic volume. So the, the volume that, or what you blew into the balloons, and it's directly related to the amount of stretch of the myo, uh, myocardial sarcomeres. And it's really the basis of the Frank Starling law. So here on the right side, as we increase the amount of air going into the balloons, we were able to increase the stroke volume and the balloons theoretically, you know, had more air and, and had increased cardiac output. You do get to a, a place, though, that you are unable to increase your cardiac output or your stroke volume for an increase in the preload. And then this is where Jesse was <coughs> with his pop balloon and RV failure. <laughs> So this is a, um, talked a lot about with the LV, but it is also true for the um, right ventricle. And we have our loops too, so I get to talk about them because I look at yours and my eyes cross. So um, this is the pressure volume loop for preload. And this amount here is stroke volume here. So here in a normal heart, as you increase the volume in the LV, you have an increased stroke volume like we saw with, um, with the balloons. And the, the uh, right ventricle, this is just uh, showing that the right ventricle actually does a very good job of um, being able to tolerate increases in the preload without a significant increase in the work. So as the atrial pressure increases, it, the work to, for car to maintain that same cardiac output stays pretty low, um, and then it gets to a point that it just can't manage it anymore. After load um, is the load on the contracting myocardium. So when the air was trying to get out of the balloon, that resistance that it was feeling, or that I guess that pressure. And so here we can see again if this is stroke volume. At the same amount of volume, you have to obtain, you have to have significant increase in pressures, um, and and the stroke uh, volume decreases. And the RV does not like to eject against any type or any significant pressures, and this is one of the main reasons for RV failure. Incre um, increases in the pressure with a significant decrease in the stroke volume due to RV failure. Um, so, um, in right in, so in RV failure, as the RV enlarges, the pressures in the RV ex exceed the pressures in the LV. And this is what we talked about. The septum moves towards the LV, and it really limits the ability for the left ventricle to fill, leading to decreased cardiac output. And we talked about ventricular inter interdependence. So this is just a still image, but as you can see, this is the RV. And, we, and one of the tricks to be able to see that in case you're trying to get images and you're not sure if your um, indicator is on the right side, the, um, the plane, the valve plane or the annulus is lower in the tricuspid valve all the time. And then the mitral valve, you see the plane up here. So this is a tiny squashed left ventricle. This is a very dilated large right ventricle. And this is um, a short axis view. You can see that this is what we call a D-shaped septum. 
flat septum here instead of the nice round um, donut. And this is in systole, even more D-shaped septum. And you can imagine that there's not much blood that's able to fill into that left ventricle, leading to a decrease in cardiac output. So a parasternal long axis, LV, RV. I, I didn't have a good normal of a parasternal long, but really this measurement of greater than three centimeters is considered enlarged. So this is a nice big RV that we'll see a little bit more of. This is a short axis, a little bit high. Here we see the mitral valve, the fish mouth, and you can see that there's a flattening of this septum, and you can imagine the RV is, is, is pretty big here. We can't see all of the walls. This is a subxiphoid image. So all of these, I'm showing you different views just to show that you can see that the RV looks poorly. Just if you try different views, Different patients, you can find different things in different locations. Um, so it's important to tr just put the probe on the chest and try different places to see if you can see the RV better in, in, in different locations. So sub -xiphoid, um, and here is the RV, so closest to the most anterior um, structure. And you can see that this septum is kind of bowing into the left ventricle here not much movement. This isn't necessarily the, um, uh, the image that we look at TAPSI, but you can imagine that this annulus isn't moving towards the apex very well. The IVC here, and large plethoric. And then again, here's a, a four chamber apical with this, this large RV, not great annular movement here, large right atrium, and really kind of a small left ventricle. So this is the plane that we look at TAPSI, or the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, um, and really trying to, really what it's doing is looking to see how much of this annulus is moving towards the apex. And what they do is then put an M mode through it and, um, and then measure from the base to the apex here. So this is a, a normal, and this would be an abnormal. They, uh, we use all sorts of different numbers, but 15 to 20 is, is thought to be um, normal. So we talk a lot about goal-directed therapy, and I think it's still very important in patients with PAH or PAH. Really, our main goal still in, in the um, PAH patients and RV failure is still to maintain adequate tissue perfusion. And this is just, um, I didn't know the answer to this. So what are the two most common sources of infections in patients with pulmonary hypertension, or PAH? <laughs> so, one, I mean, if they have parental therapy, obviously, is line infection, but two is actually bowel, they thought, due to decreased um, cardiac output, and, uh, yeah, I didn't know that. Is that a disagree or agree? I don't know. All right, so, when we're talking about pH and sepsis, while trying to maintain adequate um, perfusion, we... We, have to attempt, we, we want to attempt to do that by actually maximizing the RV function and reducing the PVR. Granted, reducing PVR is, is difficult, um, so we want to just do things that prevent it from actually increasing. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of these things, but um, we want to optimize the RV preload, improve RV contractility, and reduce RV afterload. Again, reducing the PVR is difficult, and so maximizing the RV function should be um, our, our main goals. So we know that um, typically in sepsis, there's a decreased CVP, which 
decrease in the intravascular volume, increase in vascular permeability, and decrease in the vascular tone, decrease in SVR. So fluid resuscitation, um, it's, it, it's not recommended that you do it, as, do it blindly in these patients. Um, even the, the 30 cc's per kg is difficult sometimes, and it's important to try to um, do a little bit more investigation, maybe whether it's imaging or also looking at previous right heart casts and just to get a better feeling of what this patient needs and, and where they are. Um, compared to what their baseline is. So um, if RV afterload is normal and preload needs to be increased to above normal levels sometimes, and sometimes we talk about that um, in myocardial infarctions with RV, um, with RCA infarcts and RV failure, but also in patients that have um, RV failure and it becomes kind of a conduit, and so sometimes they require increased preload to act as a conduit to try to help uh, maintain cardiac output. And I kind of think of that if I just took a normal balloon and I put a couple breaths in it. And then I have a balloon that I blew up this morning to like 10 or 15 breaths. And so it's kind of an old saggy RV here. And I put two in. The one that is, isn't used to having so much pressure tends to tolerate it um, or maintain a cardiac output. The one that's old and saggy may need increased fluids and increased preload to maintain that cardiac output. Does that make sense to anybody? I don't know. So if you have old right heart cast for patients with chronic RV failure, they, it could be important. Um, and then with PAH, it gets a little bit harder because you seem to be giving the fluids. You, you, they, they look dry. They feel, you feel like you want to try to improve their blood pressure with fluids. But because of the afterload, like with the, the balloon that I showed that had the clip on it, it really just make fluids make the RV get more distended and fail worse, if that's possible. And really, then you get that septum shift into the left ventricle, which actually decreases the cardiac output. So again, here, um, with probably a high afterload, I would guess, the more fluids you get makes this RV bigger and pushes the septum over more, which decreases the cardiac output. So, Vigileo is easy, put in order, does it help us? So, um, you know, this is one of the principles f for using the Vigileo um, was it for patients in sepsis and as uh, when your volume is re re responsive, as you increase your volume, then you have a significant increase in your, your stroke volume, but you get to a point like Jesse and his balloon that more air doesn't help. I mean, more fluids doesn't increase stroke volume. And when they did, um, when they did this ROC curve for the patients, it really showed that um, the pulse pressure variation is what the Vigileo is based on, is actually a great tool for volume responsiveness, and I think it's a great reason why we use it. Unfortunately, this is the ROC curve for patients with um, pH and sepsis. Not great. So really, unfortunately, Vigileo is not a good tool to um, help us with volume uh, responsiveness in patients with sepsis and pH. Or, yeah, pH. So um, we have to look at other tools. So um, central venous catheter to look at the um, CVP can be difficult too sometimes. A lot of these patients have a lot of tricuspid regurgitation that can make the CVP um, tend to look higher, but it, I think it's a, a good tool. And then really trying to get the echo on the chest. Put some gel on it and, and put it in different locations and just try to find some views that you can get an idea of what the RV to LV 
what 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 the ratio what how they compare to each other I think is really important it doesn't need all these fancy numbers and fancy images just really uh, a couple pictures can tell you a lot we can look at the septum and see if it's bowing to the into the right ventricle or the left ventricle the IVC and then pulmonary artery catheter um, may be uh, a, a, a useful tool in patients that were really struggling with fluid status and, and RV failure. And then just like in normal patients, SVO2 can help assess the actual oxygen delivery. I, yeah. I have a so in patients with pulmonary hypertension, they, I mean, they always have RV dilation and enlargement. And when you say just put an echo and look at it, it's just what are findings that tell you this is the acute, like, like failure based on echo? Um, I, I, it, so it tends to be, and I don't think you can say it, it does exactly, because it tends to be acute, really, like if you get acute PE, it, it looks horrible and, and the RV blows out really quickly. If it's kind of a chronic, like worsening pressures, worsening afterload, the RV does have some ability to enlarge a little bit, get a little bit thicker, and be able to keep normal um, RV function. So some things I use are like looking at the atrium. If the atrium is huge, then this is probably longer standing. Um, if the atrium is not and the, RV, and the RV looks huge and isn't moving, it's probably more acute. They do, they do, they do have right to trigger ejection fraction catheters, uh, PA catheters that are specifically measure our RV. They came out like 20 years ago. It's not been very popular because obviously can't use it anymore, but they do have specific PA catheters that measure right to trick the patient. It's called a rep catheter. Hmm. Any other questions? So should you really diurese patients with sepsis? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> So really, sometimes fluid <laughs> removal for these patients is the best way. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know I'm going to get shunned. But really, fluid removal may be the best way to improve RV function and oxygen delivery in these patients. And I'm not saying kind of in the early goals, but um, really fluid removal becomes crucial if, if you can increase your cardiac output. <clears throat> So we talked about some of the causes of reduced um, contractility is overstretching or increased preload. And then we're going to talk about coronary perfusion and then um, and other, some other derangements in cellular metabolism. So coronary perfusion um, is different from the right ventricle and the left ventricle. In the left ventricle, it occurs during diastole because of the increased pressures in the LV during systole, the, the uh, coronary perfusion is low, and then as the left ventricle is relaxing, then the blood can flow into the coronaries for the left ventricle. In the right ventricle, because typically there is, um, it's, a low, it's a lower pressure, it actually, the right coronary can perfuse both in, during systole and diastole. As the pressures increase in the right ventricle, then it limits the uh, coronary perfusion in the uh, during systole, and then now it's just depending on the coronary perfusion in diastole. So as the pressures increase, as well as a decrease in the systemic blood pressure, the RV is having to work harder against higher pressures, and it really leads to significant RV ischemia, which also leads to increased RV failure. So um, just some other um, points. This and I'm, is um, a study that was done on newborn calves. So just keep that in mind. But um, really what it's showing is that um, acidosis and decreased oxygen really can increase the PVR by significant amounts. And as you get more acidotic, it seems to be it happen at um, higher oxygen. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, this happens earlier here. So we want to try to really avoid hypercapnia and acidemia um, for these patients because it does increase um, PBR. And then, hy yeah, and hypoxia, you get the basal constriction. So. so if anybody wants to know what I see when I see a chest x-ray, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> You'll see something else. <laughs> uh, but arrhythmias um, are common in patients with RV failure, mostly because of the dilation, the dilated atrium. Um, and so, supraventricular tach tachyarrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, a flutter, are the most common. And they're really poorly tolerated. They talk about this atrial kick, but essentially, the atri if the atrium are contract in contracting with the ventricle or right prior to the ventricle contraction, it can help with forward flow of the blood, it's thought. And really, when you lose that, uh, you get worsening in, um, in systemic blood pressure and worsening in cardiac output. And so it's really recommended to restore sinus rhythm if possible. Uh, rate control is not usually sufficient because rate control is with, usually with negative inotropes and um, beta blockers and whether we want to put calcium channel blockers in there and then, um, and then you still don't get the atrial kick. There is some um, talk about digoxin in patients like this. I, I think people still use it as a, as a as a tool, but they'd really recommend res restoration of the sinus rhythm. So usually that's with amiodarone and DC cardioversion. So sometimes we still have to use vasopressors in these patients. Um, you know, we really want to try to increase the the um, systemic arterial pressure and RV contractility without raising PVR, and that becomes a problem with some of the vasopressors. So here's just a quick chart. Um, norepinephrine has, has the most research um, and has been shown to be actually the most beneficial in these patients. Uh, you get some increase in the, um, the inotropy and you do get some vasoconstriction, but it doesn't seem to be as, you get other benefits that help you in patients with um, PAH or PH um, without the bad, without the, the risk. So phenylephrine is a vasoconstrictor, and there was some talk at some point that this was a good drug, but now we know that it does actually increase the PVR also. And you can get reflex bradycardia, um, which, again, these patients don't tolerate very well. Epinephrine has, is, is an option. It isn't really studied in patients with sepsis and PAH, um, but you, you can get significant vasoconstriction. And vasopressin, um, I didn't know this, but at low doses, actually, you can get some a vasodilator property, and it is up to 0.03, I think, mics per kilo per minute, I think is the... But at higher doses, you get coronary vasoconstriction also. Um, you know, dopamine is possible better at low doses, but you get increased arrhythmias, and we've really transitioned to uh, norepinephrine. As far as, the, as far as the inotropies, dobutamine and milrinone, they both increase arrhythmias. Dobutamine seems to increase arrhythmias a little bit more and give you a little bit more yeah, um, possible hypotension from, from the decrease in the SVR. So for here, melrino would be the inotrope of choice. So we try to avoid them if possible um, because of the increased risk of tachyarrhythmias. We want to just like we do norm with people without PH or PAH, just avoid increasing cardiac output above normal levels to decrease the risks. And um, really should only be used if needed, but still systolic blood pressure is important for these patients. So, 
Um, there is a medication, and I, I feel like we, like everything you read, you see this medication, but it's not um, FDA approved here. It looks like they use it a decent amount in Europe. You guys might know more about it. Um, it's levosimendin, and it's a calcium sensitizer, and it is is said to um, enhance myocardial contractility without increasing, um, oh, without increasing oxygen demand, essentially. And there have been cl um, clinical trials that have shown improvement in RV systolic function, diastolic function, and left heart failure, and I think actually in CTAF and maybe RV failure. Um, but still, there's a phase three trial going on right now with LV, func LV dysfunction and bypass. Um, but it's not currently FDA approved here. Do you think it's going to be a good drug or a bad drug? It's very popular in Europe. As a matter of fact, it's a mesenteric vasodilator, too, so it kind of counteracts the issues you talk about with uh, sepsis on the belly. So, yeah, it's very common. It's been used for 15 years or yeah. so. I don't know why it's not here yet. The other question is um, that now with the new generation, I don't know if y'all got them yet, but they're changing over the vigilados to new. actually in service on this week, so you should probably be seeing them in the next couple of weeks, but they'll give you another, perhaps, endpoint that'll tell you if these patients are too fluid. See, but the problem with these patients is if you give them fluid, if you give them too much, it stays on the right side. Yeah, theoretical. You know, a, a lot of us are monitoring. You know, we can theoretically say well, this is that, but you have no objective measures. At least, you, you know, you can pretty much deal with the titrate, and that's all what it's all about. We, we subjectively, you know, say physiologically that's what happens, but we don't really know. You know, these people are not pure. They come in with renal failure. <laughs> it's not like it's just pulmonary hypertension. <laughs> There's some other problems going on, too. So, albumins are 1.7. It's just a whole mess. Yeah. They are. And then if you intubate, I don't know if you're going to. I'm not going to talk okay. about that. <laughs> Never mind. Because they're so not cute. It's so, like, it's so messy. Do you want to make a comment? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take your time. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. No, I was wondering, since I read it, so when you're, when you're intubating these patients, their they're pretty little just dumb. And then it, they invariably code. That happened to me. Uh, with Jesse's patient, I remember. And I, I said, if I interview you, you might, you might code that it happened. So I wonder, should, you know, their pressure still up? Would it be a good idea, maybe just to run levofed while you're intubating them, or run fluid while you're intubating them? Because you know it's going to happen. So yeah. So this is a problem, obviously, we've encountered forever, and. Our patients do very poorly with the drop in preload that you get around the time of initiation. And a lot of that has to do not only with the afterload that you're applying with the vent, but also the drugs that you give carry intubation. So there's a lot of talk of whether it's appropriate to do conscious sedation, which is what we routinely do, versus using something like ketamine. When we were at University of Cincinnati this week talking to their RV failure expert, he said exactly what you do, which is what you suggested was what he did, which is as soon as he's thinking about intubating someone, he puts them on levofed, titrates it up to 50 or 60 before induction, just to sort of backfill and give some pressure. Um, I don't think that's a practice pattern. Yeah. I think that's one person who does this a lot who has found that it works for him. But there's not, I mean, we've been in situations where for example, um, our patient with PVOD who was decompensating, where we chose AV ECMO in that moment rather than intubation because we knew if we intubated him, he would die. And so I think you have to think of advanced RV support. It's a lot. <laughs> and I know the anesthesia, at least a couple of journals that I read about this, they recommend um, vasopressors up front prior to induction. 
All right, I'm just going to talk quickly about pulmonary vasodilators, not a lot. I feel like when you have PAH patients that are really sick, as a cardiology fellow, we were always calling the PAH people like, is it time yet? Is it time yet? But really, they are rarely um, started in patients, um, at least from my experience, that are sick and on the vent and, and have sepsis and have, and have other things going on. Inhaled NO is talked a lot about in the pa in, on paper, and um, there's a lot of good things about it. it. It's a potent pulmonary vasodilator. It, ha it, it works really quickly. It has um, a short half-life, which is difficult sometimes, um, because so it's better to, for patients that are ventilated um, so that, that there's no stop in the NO that's being given, because patients can decompensate very quickly if it's abruptly stopped. Um, but it really can improve oxygenation and decrease intrapulmonary shunt. The biggest, um, and then here, it, it has been shown to improve RV ejection fraction, um, preload in patients with ARDS, and, and improve the pulmonary hemodynamics. I think it's extremely expensive. And so um, from my experience, the surgeons use it a decent amount still. Um, I don't know about here. but. I have rarely see it on the medicine, um, the MICUs. I don't know. Do we use it in the MICU at all? We get a lot of cost pushback. Yeah. There's, um, they're looking at inhaled flow in right now. Yeah. Going through different committees so that it's much cheaper than inhaled nitric, but it would be used for the same indications. Um, I don't know if the surgical side has started using it yet. I haven't heard that it's gone through everything it needs to go through, but it is coming. And so here, um, you know, these are um, prostacyclin analogs that we talk about. And even though it's IV here, you can get this um, inhaled, just like Dr. Gap has. And I know in the LVAD population, they're trying to push towards that because it's cheaper for patients coming off, just starting on pumps. So, so I'm just... Uh, Getting to the summary slides here, um, PAH and sepsis or RV failure and sepsis, um, you know, is there something that we can do quick that we can try to um, treat? If not, we looking at do we have too much preload or, or not enough preload for what the patient needs, fluids or, or fluid removal? Is there too much afterload? Can we correct the things that we can change, hypoxia, acidemia, hypercapnia? And um, we want to try to, use, if they're intubated, the um, low lung volumes. And then is there any way that we, do we need to increase the RV perfusion? Are we worried about RV ischemia? Um, so vasopressors. And then um, do we need our SVO2 low? Do we think that we can improve the RV contractility with inotropes? And then um, I didn't talk a lot about advanced, even advanced therapies, but ECMO, tandems, um, and transplant. But. So I still think, um, even though I talked about diuresis and sepsis, that the early goal-directed therapy is still extremely important for these patients. There's just a couple things that we want to, to think about um, instead of just going straight to um, this nice flow sheet is, you know, do we really need to intubate? Because we kind of talked about um, decreased preload and, and hypotension and the death spiral. And yet, a, a central venous catheter is great, but TE is great too and can give you a lot of information. Even if you're worried about your echo skills, just put some gel on it and look at a couple different places. You'll probably get at least one, one location that you can get some images. And CVP, again, some of these patients need more fluid. But some of these patients get, um, their, their RV just can't handle the preload. It may require fluid removal. And I think that's all I have. Questions?